Hey, Alex, what's up, dude? How's it going? It's going. What, who are you and what are you doing here and why are you wearing that t-shirt? Uh, my name is Alex Sherlian. I'm a landscape designer with the Rutgers Water Resources Program. Yay. And I'm here today to uh, finish up a huge project that we did. Oh, hey, okay, show right us. If you look right behind you. What's all that? What's going on here, man? So we're here we are at a Wheaton Arts. Yeah. And this used to be just like a lot of lawn, a lot of grass. It was really boring. I think geese would come and hang out here and do what geese do best. That's right. Eat but, and poop. Uh, Eat and poop. <laughs> um, if you look over there by the entrance of Wheaton Farms, yeah, that was where um, Wheaton Farms. I like Wheaton that Farms. better. Excuse I like that better than Wheaton Arts. <laughs> um, there was huge. They're gonna have to change their name. <laughs> <laughs> there was a huge drainage problem. So oh yes, during a bad rainstorm, there'd be a pool. It'd be pooling. Yep. And, uh, that'd be you know it's a bad problem for the asphalt. It kind of destroys it yes. during the winter time. So. Um, there was a system built here about, I don't know, maybe 50 plus years ago um, to that, kind of fix that. But over time, that system started to fail. It started to fill up with sediment. So we decided to uh, fix that in a, yes. in a different way. Other than using gray infrastructure, we wanted to use green infrastructure. Whose so idea was Was this CU's idea and then they approached you folks? Or was it your idea and you approached them? Do you know where the genesis of this rain garden was? It was all a combo. combination. combination. Uh, I think we Come on, Miss Holly, talk to me, girl. <laughs> well, Carla came in and uh, Can you take your mask down for a sec? There you are. Carla Look how gorgeous in. you are, darling. <laughs> uh, she identified a problem and um, she's always worked with Wheaton yes. as a place to host her educational programs and stuff and right. she always wanted to give back to them and I think this is the biggest way that she could have given back to them oh yeah is to help them with their stormwater issue um, we've been working with Carla for about four years now down here working on um, different projects and programs are you part of Rutgers as well yes I'm part of Rutgers can you identify yourself I'm Holly Demiro. I'm part of the Rutgers Positive Extension <laughs> hi Holly program. nice I'm a project um, manager for so I, pro I manage our interns and our staff right. and various projects, but mostly down here in the kirkwood Cohansey watershed. A beautiful watershed indeed. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. And the Pinelands, you and know. The Pinelands, yep. And who doesn't know just doesn't know. <laughs> well, now and they now should you know. know. <laughs> and now you know. And what else do you need, would you like us to know? Um, come down here and see it. Yeah. yeah really. Absolutely. Really enjoy the space that we're creating. And you're turning what to me is a sterile environment, almost nearly a sterile, unproductive environment with very shallow roots, no contribution to the groundwater, to this fabulous, gorgeous, gorgeous space. space. I hope the plants, do you think the plants are going to take? Do you, I spent two and a half months growing these little babies, and if they're not, I'm going to come after somebody, man. I'm going to come here like every three days, and I'll be like... Well, I mean, we do, we do have the water stick in, which yeah, is the a big help. Yeah, the water stick is huge. And, I mean, the engineers designed us to hold the water and the plants that we are using. Right. Um, are, you know, they're native to New Jersey here. They are. So they'll help with the pollinators, but they'll also help with, you know, being dry. Um, you know, we have the plants that are higher like to be dry. The plants that are lower when they're wet like to be wet. Right. So each plant is, has the perfect spot to gotcha. you know, fit its own little ecosystem. So. Do you think that the mulch, them going from soil to mulch is going to shock them too much to survive or do you think they're going to do well? You've well, done this before. The, usually the purpose of the mulch is just, you know, first is an aesthetic feature but really it's just to hold that another yeah. intake of water volume. Okay, because so. right below is sand. I mean, directly below is I mean, sand. This so I don't know how the roots translate from going, you know, being happy in soil medium to a sand well, situation. if the these plants were planted correctly, mm -hmm. they should have been, the mulch should have been taken away, and then you plant um, into the sand. Got it. The, the little poem I know is, if you plant it high, it'll never die, but if you plant it low, it'll never grow. So if you plant it too low, sometimes, like below the, the, um, like where the leaves are coming out, right. it might drown in like, you know, the, you won't get exposed to the sun, and they can't eat from you know, photosynthesis and all those buzzwords. <laughs> <laughs> those buzzwords, photosynthesis. <laughs> those green I'm a buzzwords. I have a, 
that's scientific. <laughs> this is wonderful. I'm really happy. And I took a look at the plans the other day, mm -hmm. so they looked really nifty. Who came up with those? So we have Tobias Horton. He was our head landscape designer, landscape architect with our program. And about a year ago, right, this is when, mm -hmm. right before COVID hit, that's when mm. um, I started working with him. He, he does all conceptual designs by hand. He really goes into detail right. of trying to make different spaces within this area. And then after he was done with that, I took that and took it into AutoCAD, gave it like the computer graphic um, line work, and then went into Photoshop and made it, you know, pretty for, you know, for the clients, for Carla and right. we and Arts to see what the space could be. We did some perspective renderings to give an idea of, you know, you know, seeing is believing. So you got to exactly. make some pretty pictures in order to sell the project. Yeah, some people them. can't really grasp it until they can visualize no. it. So, And I don't even know if you saw the engineering drawings because that's just a whole... I did. Yeah, I did. Was, I'm was, very interested in that stuff. And I took a couple of still shots of that. So that's going to be incorporated into our story time too. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and you too, Miss Holly. Really appreciate it. Everything that you're doing and I can't wait to see it as it, you know, continues to grow and mature and and it looks so much better than just this big old disc of grass. So, thank you very very much. The earth says thank you and happy Arbor Day and all that. So, Carla, thank you for this. This is amazing. I'm really happy to participate in this wonderful rain garden project. I'm happy to you, participate. You brought it to life. I'm glad that Wheaton Arts wants to make the difference for, for future generations. And Absolutely. It's a work to be a steward of our environment. That's right. And who do you represent? Who are you from? Uh, I am with Citizens United to protect the Morris River and its tributaries. Hey, didn't I see you in a canoe is, somewhere? Yeah. <laughs> The Menantico, we went out and we did the, uh, the when book I, club. When I kept calling it Menantico. <laughs> hey, Menantico. <laughs> Menu Muscoon. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the Maurice River, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, we had a great story time. And I interviewed your daughter earlier and she was just incredible. She's really good on camera, She's man. She's a CU kid. So I was thinking maybe she'll be the representative for this project. Yeah. She, she detailed all, she got very serious. She detailed all the points of why we're here and that we're here together as friends and we're doing this as a community and how oh, important nice. it is to have a rain garden. And well, she brought, she had been speaking about the project all week at school and she brought two of her friends from St. Mary's today. And I know, her Emma was great. Oh, we had a great interview. To share the project with them, I thought that was neat. I'm going to send you that footage before we edit it. Yeah. <laughs> Carla, I just want to say a giant thank you. I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my rain garden heart. Thank you. And I hope you have a really nice recovery period after this. <laughs> no, it's been fantastic. We've had a great, a great team and a wonderful team of volunteers who put hundreds of hours in this week. And businesses and came out of the woodwork and donated big boy machines and and materials and you know I'm I feel very humbled today to be I, standing with so many great volunteers and and people who you know who really benefit from a, a sense of community and all the months that we took planting all uh, growing all these beautiful plants from your germination session at the end of February till That's today right. and this is the, the fruition of it were grown by by volunteers we did at the library and I missed them I missed them already went to go water them today and I was like where's my plants yes you're all empty nesters now but this is another reason <laughs> but there's a transition period and a support group but I yes. haven't found it yet <laughs> but you can always come back to Wheaton Arts and visit your plants hey everybody what's happening welcome to story time with Miss Adaria I hope you enjoyed the stuff that you saw before this and you learned a lot we are going to be reading this amazing book called 111 Trees. And we're on the steps of a beautiful old building right here in Bridgeton. The library is right behind us. And the city hall is right across the street in case you want to orient yourself. And so if you hear some traffic noises or some music or something, it's just the everyday noises of Bridgeton. So I hope you like that.
This book is called 111 Trees, How One Village Celebrates the Birth of Every Girl. And it is written by Rena Singh and illustrated by Marianne Farrar. And Rita is dedicating this book to Julian, Ethan, Quinton, and Auden, the future eco-feminists. And Marianne has dedicated this book for you, the light that makes everything grow. Isn't that sweet? Let me just read you a little preface of what this book is all about and then we'll get right into it. Not too long ago, a village in India was ruled by ancient customs. There, the birth of a boy was celebrated with the beating of pots and pans and the sharing of sweets. A son was a blessing from the gods, someone who would carry on the family name and take care of aging parents. The birth of, the girl, of a girl was welcomed with silence. A daughter was a burden. Someone who could cost parents a dowry, which is money given to the family that she marries into, when she got married and who would become the property of her husband. But today things are different in that village. Today one girl equals 111 trees. This is a true story. And it all started with a boy named Sundar. Sundar watches how his mother balances the water pot on her head. Walking to the well with her every day in the blistering heat is hard, but it's his favorite thing to do. It's the only time he has her all to himself. On the way back, they stop under some trees and she asks him to collect pieces of firewood for cooking. He sees her smile at him through her veil. At night, Sundar feels his mother's wet cheeks as she hushes him and his two hungry sisters to sleep. The mud house is far too small for their family of 11. One night, Sundar's mother is bitten by a poisonous snake. In the morning, she doesn't wake up. The villagers come to her door, they wail loudly, and they take her away. And just like that, his mother is gone. After this, whenever Sundar sees women walking to the well, he runs to wrap his arms around a tree, pretending to hug his mom. Poor Sundar. Years pass. Look at this beautiful picture. Look at, there's a peacock. Sundar grows up. He marries and becomes a father. He has two daughters and a son, and he and his wife raise them with equal love and joy. As his children grow, he teaches them the names of the trees and the birds. He shows them how their lives depend on the natural world. All of our lives depend on the natural world and he guides them to embrace all forms of life. He's a smart papa. Whoa, I dropped the book. Sundar works as a laborer in a marble factory not far from his village. The process of mining the marble strips the soil dumps waste into the land and leaves the landscape dry and barren, making any kind of farming difficult. He asks the factory owners to plant trees to make up for the harm they are doing to the countryside, but they refuse. Sundar begins to fear for the future well-being of his village. He is so angry about this that they won't plant trees that he leaves his job. Sundar brims with ideas to make life better. 
here goes the school bus. Woohoo! Sundar brims with ideas to make life better for the per for the people of his village. He wants no one to live in fear of hunger. He wants all children, boys and girls, to go to school and not spend their childhoods working in the fields or fetching water. He wants to heal the land that is ravaged by irresponsible mining. He dreams of planting trees. He runs in the election to become a Sarpanch, the village head, kind of like the mayor. And he wins. Hey, Sundar! Woo! A vote for Sundar is a vote for trees. I bet that was one of his banners. <laughs> One year later, his older daughter dies after a brief illness. Sundar is heartbroken and he shuts himself in a room and cries for 12 days. On the 13th day, he comes out and he plants some saplings, which are little trees. Burying his grief into the earth, Sundar imagines the saplings growing into magnificent trees that will live for hundreds of years and with them will live the memory of his daughter. All of a sudden, Sundar knows what he has to do. You hear the birdies? Hey, birdies, what's happening? Such a beautiful day, so nice to be outside. Every girl born in the village will be welcomed with the planting of 111 trees. Hey, I would plant a tree or two for the boys also. Sundar shares his idea with the men and women of the village. The villagers think Sundar has lost his mind. They reject his plan. It's against their tradition to honor girls. Hey, wait a minute. They argue. They are afraid the world will laugh at them. They don't understand this new way of thinking. Another bus! But Sundar keeps talking to the villagers. She shows them how the factory is slowly destroying the land. He tells them of other nations where girls and boys are treated equally. Another bus. Where there is plenty of water and electricity and enough wealth and knowledge to go to the moon. He even offers to plant trees in the girls' names himself. If the villagers promise to send their daughters to school and wait to marry them off until they turn 18. That's a lot of change for that culture. Slowly, very slowly. The villagers begin to understand that by welcoming girls and planting trees, they might bring balance back to nature. They worry about the water the trees will need. But Sundar has a plan for that too. He brings in engineers from the city and the villagers learn how to harvest rain by digging trenches to store water. Water that can also be used for drinking. When termites infect some of the trees, the women grow aloe vera plants to cure them. This is aloe down here. See all these aloe? So they're taking care of the tree's health. They're like tree doctors. Tree nurses. Look how beautiful. All their hard work is paying off. Look at all that stuff. see that women no longer have to walk for hours to fetch water. The women see that their children are no longer hungry. The trees are making life better for everyone. The villagers begin to place their trust in Sundar and every time a girl is born the villagers plant how many? 111 trees. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 
The trees and the girls grow up together. The mothers and the daughters take care of the trees. At the end of every summer, girls tie sacred threads around the trunks to renew their bonds with them. Look how pretty that picture is. Isn't that a sweet picture? The village prospers. I just saw another bus. That's four buses. The village prospers and the trees continue to grow. Today, mango, papaya, neem, shisham, and arnla trees line the roads and cascade down the hillsides. Wow. That's a big difference. Remember how it looked when he left his job? It was just barren land to looking like this. So beautiful. There's enough water for everyone in the village. The girls go to school and learn along with the boys. And to this day, every time one girl is born, 111 trees are planted. And look, here's the real Sundar. Surrounded by trees, it tells you all of the information about what we just read about. So if you want to read this and learn more for yourself, come into the library and get this book. It's called 111 Trees, and it's a new book, so it's on our new bookshelves. Wow, that was a great story. There's all kinds of information about the change that Sundar helped make in his little village. I'm giving that book 111. Five school buses. And now look at this book. Five school buses and one motorcycle. <laughs> How are they not deaf? I don't understand. So this book is called Ant and Honeybee. What a pair. By Megan McDonald and illustrated by G. Brian Carras. And I like this book because today on our crafts, we're gonna do um, a really cool pollinator craft so it kind of goes along with the whole rain garden trees planting pollinator theme that we're on so um <clears throat> excuse me megan has dedicated this book to judy ingram atkins and g brian Carras has dedicated this book to ben and sam Aunt was getting antsy. She stared out of the window at, at the gray clouds. Only a few hours left till Cricket's costume party. I love the drawings. It's nice and quiet right now. That won't last for long. What can we be for dress up party? She asked her friend Honeybee. Pilgrims, said Honeybee. Pilgrims? But we've been pilgrims for two years in a row, said Aunt. Pilgrims are boring. Then be an ear of corn. It will make if it will make you happy, said Honeybee. Well, what will you be if I'm an ear of corn? said Aunt. I'll be a bee, said Honeybee. But you are a bee. You can't be just you, said Aunt. It's good to be yourself, said Honeybee. <laughs> well, you could be that any time, said Aunt. I know. Let's be a pair. I'll be the pear and you be the stem. No, not that kind of pear. I meant a two things that go together kind of pear. Honeybee thought she meant a pear that you could eat like a piece of fruit. Six, six school buses. <laughs> then I'll be an ant eater said honeybee and you be the ant too scary said ant <laughs> look at her running away with all her legs ant 
thought about things that go together. She looked in the kitchen, peanut butter and jelly. She looked in the bathroom, toilet paper and toilet. She looked in the laundry room. I know, let's be a washer and dryer. A washer and dryer make a good pair, said Honeybee. Yippee, no more pilgrims. And Honeybee and Ant found two boxes that were just the right size. Ant cut holes for the legs and a big hole for her head in one box. Honeybee cut two holes for legs and wings and a big hole for her head in the other box. Ant and Honeybee made knobs and dials and drew soap suds down the front of her washer. Honeybee glued fuzzy cotton balls for lint on her dryer. They worked as hard as two ants in an anthill. They worked as hard as two bees in a beehive. <laughs> I like ant and bee together. Blub, blub, said ant, just like a washer when it washes clothes. Buzz, 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 buzz said Honeybee, just like a, a dryer when it's done drying. We make the best washer and dryer, said Ant. We make the best pair, said Honeybee. It's time for Cricket's party. When Ant tried to walk down the front steps, she could hardly move her legs. When Honeybee tried to walk down the sidewalk, she couldn't see where she was going. She walked right into the grass. They couldn't see above that box, right? It's so hard to walk when you're a washer, and it's hard to see when you're a dryer. The wind blew Ant and Honeybee down the street where they bumped into Beetle and Fly. I think they were going to the same party. Look, two dice, said Beetle. No, it's a couple of ice cubes, said Fly. Blub, blub, said Ant, so everyone she would know she's a washer. Buzz, said B, so everyone would know that she was a dryer. Hey, Swiss cheese, called Butterfly. Yum, yum, are those moth holes? Show them your spin cycle, Ant, said Honeybee. Show them your tumble dry, said Ant. Ant spun around in circles. Blub, blub. Honeybee bounced up and down. Buzz. They spun and bounced all the way down the hill and they ran into spiders. Look, it's a stove and a dishwasher, said Old Man Spider. No, honey, can't you see, said Mrs. Spider. It's two computers. Dancing computers, very clever. No one knows what we are, said Honey Bee. Mr. and Mrs. Spider thought we were clever, said Ant. No, they thought dancing computers were clever, said Honeybee. They see the dark cloud forming above them. Just then a gust of wind blew up. Then plip, 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 plip. Oh no, rain, said Ant, run. We can't run, said Honeybee. We can hardly walk. Ant and Honeybee waddled through the pouring rain all the way to Cricket's party. My washer is leaking, said Ant. My dryer is all wet, said Honeybee. Ant and Honeybee did not look like a washer and dryer. They did not even look like dice or ice cubes or dancing computers. They did not look like a pair of things that go together. They look like soggy blobs of wet cardboard and a couple of mud pies. Poor kids, they tried so hard. Ant and Honeybee dragged themselves up the steps, one, two, three, to Cricket's front door. Ant was not going blub blub and the Honeybee was not going buzz. Cricket opened the door. No pilgrims this year? Look at Cricket, isn't that a great outfit? And look, he has a moon in his door, a crescent moon. No, no pilgrims. So what are you? Cricket asked. They kind of look like beehives. Ant, oh, sorry, I blew it. 
Ant looked at Honey Bee and Honey Bee looked at Ant. Maybe Honey Bee's soggy cardboard lump didn't look so lumpy. Maybe Ant's soggy cardboard blob did not look so blobby. She's a beehive, said Ant. And Honey Bee smiled and said, she's an ant hill. <laughs> Very creative, said Cricket. What a pair. The end. Yay! So the moral of this story is even if you start out as something, something happens, you could finish as something else. Isn't that wonderful? Yay! Thank you for tuning in to our story time. <coughs> Excuse me. I think I just swallowed an ant or a bee. Please stay tuned for a craft. It's going to be so much fun. Thank you for watching our rain garden spectacular. We're so happy that you were able to join us and big shouts out going out to everybody who participated in making the rain garden happen. We're so happy you were able to watch with us today. Please stay tuned for part three next week. And until then, have a wonderful day and happy reading. Hey everybody, I just wanted to say, uh, please come in for your butterfly stencils that you could paint or draw on for your monarch butterflies. And uh, I also just wanted to say that this t-shirt that says Earth Day celebrating 50 years. I just wanted to show you my pin. It's my Earth Day 20 year pin that I got in 1990 up at Liberty State Park when we celebrated Earth Day up there. So happy Earth Day, <laughs> 50, 30 years later. Oh my goodness, I feel so old. And don't forget to come in. These will be at the front desk if you wanna come in and pick up a craft to, to grab and go. Thank you so much, take care. Hello again. How are you? How are you? I wish I knew some sign language. Uh, I think the only sign language I know is love. Love. That's a good one to know. So what are we doing today? Well, welcome to Crafting with Miss Adaria, and we really hoped you enjoyed your stories and your visits and everything is groovy. This one is going to be uh, not a bee, no, but this one we're going to learn all about the monarch butterfly. That's right, and why the monarch is so important, not only as a pollinator, but as a species. It's just a really lovely butterfly. And here we have a young, gorgeous looking milkweed plant, which the mama butterfly lays the eggs on. And those eggs turn into caterpillars and the caterpillars eat the milkweed and then they go off the milkweed and do all sorts of amazing transformational things. So the first thing that we're gonna do today, while I'm gonna read you all about exciting things about the monarch butterfly, is we have this stencil of a butterfly. And um, I'm going to cut out the body I mean the uh, wings, and I'm gonna leave them together and then we're going to cut out the body and the antenna and then we're gonna paint it with watercolors. You could do it with crayons, with Sharpies, with regular paint like tempera, or you could do it with watercolor or you could do it with colored pencil, whatever floats your boat. But today I'm just gonna do this with watercolor because I think it's gonna be really pretty. Now, a monarch butterfly is a very special creature. It, it starts its life as an egg. And as I said, the mama monarch lays eggs on the milkweed plant. And uh, after the eggs are laid onto the plant, about 10 or 15 days after the caterpillar emerges from the little egg sac and eats the egg sac as its first meal, it develops into a fully formed adult caterpillar. Now that looks like this stage right here. See that caterpillar? And that caterpillar sheds its skin four times during its larval stage. When it's, in, when it's a caterpillar, it's called the larval stage. And there's always a newer, larger skin underneath, just like a snake. 
You see how snakes shed their skin and there's a newer, larger skin underneath? Well, if it's full grown, it's not gonna be larger, but these caterpillars grow into their skin, so to speak. So every uh, shed of a skin is going to reveal a newer, larger skin to hold its body. Now, what's really interesting about the caterpillars is they have a mouth, they have mouth parts that can bite and chew. And so they're just eating and eating and eating and eating and eating. And mostly what the monarchs feed on are milkweed plants. So they need a lot of milkweed plants in your backyard or out in a field somewhere in order to be able to grow for the next couple of days so they can, or a couple of weeks so they can uh, go into their pupa state, which is right before they transform into a butterfly, they turn into a pupa. And that is this stage right here. So right before a butterfly, I'm sorry, a caterpillar um, attaches itself, finishes eating, and it crawls off. It probably leaves the milkweed plant and goes about 20 or 30 feet away to find a safe place to pupate. This is a word for that stage, pupa stage. And what it does is it, it lays a silk mat onto the surface of wherever it's found a, a cool place to, to do its metamorphosis. And it attaches itself to that silk mat with a little hook at the end of its body called a cremaster. And what happens again is for about a full day, the caterpillar just wrinkles up and shrivels up a little bit. It's, and it's little antennae wrinkle up and its skin wrinkles up and it hangs upside down and it allows its skin and tentacles to wrinkle. Then it sheds that last layer of skin for the fifth and last time. And then underneath that is this jade green casing called a chrysalis. And then inside of this chrysalis, the pupa stage, which lasts about 10 to 14 days, uh, the miracle of it turning from a caterpillar into a butterfly occurs. And we'll, we'll, I'll read you more about that after we finish doing some more of this stuff. So tell me how cool monarch butterflies are. I think they are very cool. You know what's really cool about a monarch, in my humble opinion? Monarchs are the only butterflies that migrate south and then migrate north again just like birds do. And do you know that a monarch can migrate up to 3,000 miles? Imagine you were just this tiny little butterfly, light as a feather, and you have to travel 3,000 miles to get out of the cold winter because they can't tolerate cold weather. So they, they go to warmer places. So the caterpillar, I'm sorry, the monarch butterflies from the East Coast, they go all the way down to Mexico they travel down to a place called the Sierra Madre Mountains in Mexico. And the monarch butterflies from the West Coast, they come down from uh, the north of California and they overwinter in places called Santa Cruz or San Diego. And here's a fun uh, Miss Adaria fact. When I was living in California, which I did for about 13 years, from 1996 to about 2009, I was in Santa Cruz singing with a band, and after the show, I stayed over because it was about two hours from my house up in San Francisco, and I went to this beautiful park overlooking the Pacific, and I was watching the surfers and right up there on the bluffs and just enjoying the beautiful day, and I looked around and I saw all these butterflies. I mean, not just a couple floating around, but thousands and thousands and probably hundreds of thousands of butterflies and they were monarch butterflies and so I had just I had no idea because I didn't know where they came from or where they went to or where they hung out but I just happened to be there at the same time that all these hundreds of thousands of beautiful monarch butterflies were doing their thing. They were overwintering in Santa Cruz. And I laid down on the ground between two trees, which were covered with butterflies. I mean, 
you couldn't even see the trees. They were just butterflies. And I laid my hand out. I made sure, be very careful not to lay or disturb any butterflies that were on the ground. And I just laid my hand out there on the ground. And two butterflies just landed right on my hand. And I was just watching them for a while and they were looking at me and then they took off back up into the tree or wherever they went. Um, but I've never seen such a spectacular sight in my life as uh, being eyewitness to those hundreds and hundreds of thousands of monarch butterflies. So I feel completely honored that I got to witness that. And I didn't know, I was just there for a gig, man. So that was very cool. So those were the California, the Western monarch butterflies. And so to start, monarch butterflies are usually just like dark orange with a little bit of a lighter yellowy orange and some white spots. So most of these white spots here are going to stay white. This part in here is going to be all orange and these spots up in this area are going to be that lighter orange, kind of yellowy orange color. So let's see how this works. Let's see if we can even um, get the watercolor to go on this paper. If not, we're probably gonna have to cut and, and go to magic marker, but that's okay. I think it'll work. I have hope. Yay, it's working. So there it is. There's that first, there's that first color that you're gonna lay down. Um, it's orange and it's very pretty. Orange, you glad I chose orange butterfly to do today? I don't know if you could see the paint. I'm gonna stick it a little closer to the middle so you can see what I'm doing. Now we can do the next one. And it's okay if you go outside the lines a little bit because the black, the background is black and it's very forgiving. You can hold the butterfly down with one of your hands while you do this. And if you feel like being ambidextrous, which means using both of your hands, try it. Give your right hand a break if you're right-handed and your left hand will be like, wow, I'm doing something besides holding something. <laughs> and it's also good for your brain to use both sides of your body too. So if you're feeling adventurous, just paint with your other hand. Whoa, look at that. How beautiful is this butterfly gonna be? Monarchs are so pretty. I saw a couple last year. I planted a bunch of uh, pollinator-friendly plants on my deck, and I watched the butterflies come and go. And what was really cool is that a black swallowtail butterfly mama came and laid her eggs on my parsley, of all things, that I had growing out on the deck. And she just did her business and took off. And I saw these little eggs there and I was like, oh, wow. And then literally a couple days later, there was these little baby caterpillars eating all my parsley. And I said, it's okay, you go for it. Because parsley will grow back if you cut it down or if it's eaten down. So I certainly didn't mind sharing. And I watched these little caterpillars do their thing and they got bigger and bigger and bigger and it didn't take very long at all. It was just like a couple of days and all of a sudden they were full grown caterpillars. And once they've eaten all they wanted to eat, they wandered off and they went into their pupa stage to transform into more swallowtail butterflies. So how cool is that story? I got to watch nature from my backyard last year and we're painting we're painting and here's a couple more fun facts about butterflies that you might not have known so just going on to the the pupa stage and the chrysalis now what's going on during that time is very interesting uh, they are it's called metamorphosis right and the caterpillar is transforming into a butterfly inside of that chrysalis and what happens is it becomes a different creature altogether it's it's quite miraculous actually if you think about it it goes from having eight legs eight I'm sorry eight pairs of legs to only having three pairs of legs it goes from having a mouth that can chew and eat leaves 
to having a little proboscis or a tongue that can only suck up nectar. So the monarch butterfly, once it becomes a butterfly or any butterfly really will never eat again. It will can only have the ability to drink nectar. And that is from flowers and vegetables, right? Fruits and vegetables, the flowers of fruits and vegetables. And uh, what else happens? Oh, when they're caterpillars, their eyesight is pretty poor. They can't really see too much and their eyes are small. But when they become butterflies, they get these big giant eyeballs and they're able to see incredibly well with their eyes as opposed to when they were a caterpillar and they can hardly see. A little blind caterpillar went to a beautiful magical butterfly that could see. And I guess it's helpful to be able to see like that when you're flying so that you don't fly into things and you know what plants to land on that's, that are going to feed you. And another thing that happens is um, they will also form reproductive organs, which mean that they can find their mate and make new butterflies or new eggs, I should say. So they are doing all of this inside the chrysalis and would you believe that all that stuff that goes from it looking like a caterpillar to a butterfly only takes 10 to 14 days. That's it, two weeks or less than two weeks to go from a, a cute little crawly caterpillar to this magnificent butterfly who can fly and drink nectar and has these amazing wings. Two weeks. Wow. I'm always amazed by nature and this is one of those events in nature that just constantly amaze, amazes me. I'm never, I would never take for granted the process of transformation like metamorphosis because it's just, it's a miracle. So once, uh, once the butterfly emerges, do you see this part right here? They, they, there's no, there's no like grand opening or nothing. The, the chrysalis just cracks open and the butterfly hangs off the chrysalis until it pumps something into its body that's called hemolymph. And what's, what that is, it's insect blood. It's not exactly the same thing as our blood, but it's the blood that runs through most insects. And so the butterfly is busy pumping hemolymph through into its whole body. And when they, are, when they first pop out of the chrysalis, their wings are small and wrinkled up and kind of, of wet. And the hemolymph pumps into those wings and makes them full size and makes their body full size and it gets time and air and and things like that help the butterfly dry its wings uh, it takes about an hour this whole process of them to pump this uh, insect blood through their vein or I don't know if they have veins I'm sorry through their body and for their wings to dry and become ready for flight. I think that's amazing. I mean, it's only an hour, an hour, people, from when time you pop out of your chrysalis when you used to be a caterpillar to uh, that 10 to 14 day period. And then and it only takes an hour once you're out of your chrysalis before you can go fly off into the air. Now, what the butterfly does is it finds flower nectar to drink, and then it looks for a mate to start a whole new generation of little eggs that will eventually become caterpillars, that will eventually become monarch butterflies. And the whole and the cycle begins again. Now, the sad thing is, and I don't know if it's sad, maybe, because it's just life, you know, you got to accept it, whatever it is, but the... Monarch butterflies that don't migrate, they only live from for two to six weeks. That's it. That's their life cycle. That whole caterpillar and chrysalis and forming into a butterfly and then looking for 
eating, you know, drinking nectar and looking for a mate to make more little butterflies, that only, some of them only live from two to six weeks for that whole process. But the ones that do migrate, they can live up to nine months. And during that nine months, two months of that time is spent migrating to a different place. They can go about 50 to 100 miles a day, and it takes two months for uh, the butterflies to get from the East Coast down to the uh, Santa, I'm sorry, the Sierra Madre Mountains in, in Mexico. And I'm going to say maybe about 20 years ago, nobody knew where the butterflies went. They, no one actually followed them from, say, New Jersey down to Mexico. You know, they knew they went there, but they didn't know exactly where in Mexico that they overwintered. And some wonderful, you know, wildlife biologist or amateur, somebody found the, the colony of these uh, monarch butterflies. And so Mexico and the United States formed a coalition to protect that area so that the monarchs had a, a place to go to when they migrated all the way down there. So I believe that this is now a protected area down in Mexico. And um, problem up here is that a lot of the monarchs territory or the habitat ha has been developed or ruined by pollution. And a lot of people that use things like Roundup and other pesticides and, and um, herbicides in their backyard, uh, this definitely hurts the monarchs and they don't want to come back to a place that's polluted or unfriendly. So the habit between the habitat loss and the use of these horrible chemicals, these poor butterflies are just kind of dwindling and they're, you know, becoming endangered and and um, I'm hoping that they're not going to be extinct because they're amazing creatures and they have every right to live on this planet just like we do. And we need to do all that we can to protect them. So that's why I'm always encouraging people to plant milkweed and other uh, type of pollinator food in their backyard just and stop using those terrible chemicals because not only is it killing pollinators like... Uh, monarch butterflies, but it's really damaging to bees too. And we need bees. We need all of our insects. You know, even though they might be considered pests to some people, they aren't. They are here for a reason. A beezen. <laughs> Just like we are. So so what I did was I, I didn't have this that exact color, that kind of yellowy orange color. So I mixed a little bit of the orange and this yellow that's right next to it together. And that gave me that kind of pale or that orangey yellow that I was looking for. And a little bit of water kind of did the rest. And I'm just going to do uh, the ones up here. So it's basically these groupings here. And this three right here that get this orangey yellow paint. And the rest of these, you could just leave them white spots. And we'll come back here and do the same thing with these guys. I'm going to do use my other hand, see if I can. All right. That's a good job. Miss it, all right. <laughs> Thank you. I tried. Oh, yeah. Get that a little more yellowy. I don't want it to be, I don't want it to look like the other orange. So I'll just get that. I think I have a little bit too much paint on the brush for this paper. This paper held up pretty well. I just printed out uh, this butterfly on a piece of regular paper, you know, regular computer paper. It's holding up pretty well to the watercolor. All right, so that's our that is our monarch painted. I'm just gonna take a little bit of paint off of this one because it looks like a totally different color. Now there's also a body that you can put on, but the body needs to be painted. It needs to be painted 
black. So I'm just gonna cut it out first, and then we're gonna paint it. And the antenna too. But you could do that with a magic marker or a pencil. Because, I think, yeah, we have black paint here. But I don't know how dark it's gonna be, because it's watercolor. So I'm just cutting out the antenna. Oh, here's a couple of more fun facts. So I, as I said, the Monarch travels 3,000 miles to get down to Mexico from the East Coast. And how does it go? How does it travel? How, how does it fly? I mean, why doesn't a huge gust of wind just blow it onto the ground and it not be able to, to take off against a wind or a storm? Well, butterflies use things called combination of air currents and thermals which is like a big gush of warm air that people who fly are uh, know what what that's all about birds use thermals all the time if you see a bunch of birds in the sky and they're kind of flying around in a circle and every time they get go around a circle they get a little bit higher they're flying in a thermal because the warm air uh, lifts them up into the sky. So the butterflies use that same concept of a thermal and to get them up in the air and then they use air currents to fly them down to where they want to go. And as I said, they only travel about 50 to 100 miles a day. So it takes them about two months to get from the East Coast down into Mexico for their overwintering. So that's two months out of their eight or nine month lifespan spent riding air currents to get to someplace 3,000 miles away. Do you know how long 3,000 miles is? 3,000 miles is, is if you were going from here to California. So it's clear across the country. Or if you're going from here to say London, that's about 3,000 miles across the ocean. That's a long way to fly for a tiny little butterfly, don't you think? My goodness. And we have the convenience of flying in airplanes or helicopters or with our wings. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Do you fly with your wings? Let's see if we actually have black. Is that black? Yeah, it looks black. But... So I'm just going to come in and paint the body. Okay. And we're going to paint the little antenna too. You can hold that down with one of your fingers. Just go whoop. You have to make that noise when you're painting it. Whoop. And then do that part. Whoop, 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 whoop. See how it looks like light gray, not really black. That's because it's a watercolor. It's all right. It's okay. And we're just going to let those puppies dry there for a while. And so when you're ready, uh, just take them off of the paper that they're resting on. You could tape or glue the body like this. And you could put the antenna going this way. Because their antenna is right on the top of their head. Oh, let me get the other one without wiping all the paint off of it. And there you have your beautiful monarch butterfly. Ta-da! So plant your milkweed plants. Be nice to your butterflies. And don't use those nasty chemicals in your backyards, please, because they will hurt these poor little butterflies and the bees. Yay! Thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed it. Grow your milkweed plants. Have a lovely day. Thanks again for subscribing to our channel. And we'll see you next week. And until then, peace, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Bye.